to introduce two of uh, very eminent professors. Uh, they are big figures in the field of colorectal and laparoscopic surgery. So the first one is uh, Professor Leroy. So he's well known to this forum. So I think everyone knows him and he has enriched this forum many times. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you for the first time today, Professor Frederick, um, who is the head or the chief of colorectal surgery uh, in Louis Moret University Hospital, University of Paris. And he's also a co-founder and co-chairman of Hanoi High Tech Digestive Center in St. Paul Hospital, Hanoi, Vietnam. And uh, today you are going to talk to us about surgery for anal incontinence. So Prof, we can start. Thank you, thank you very much. First of all, I, 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 I wanted to warmly uh, thank you for your invitation to participate in this uh, internet session. It's uh, always an, an incredible uh, network with interesting and international conferences. So th thank you very much. It's also uh, always a pleasure to discuss with uh, Joel about colorectal surgery. So um, this evening we are going to talk about surgery for anal incontinence. So as you see, uh, the risk of, uh, of continence disorders is, uh, is known, is well known after colorectal surgery and uh, particularly after uh, cancer of the very low rectum with uh, inter sphincteric reduction techniques. But as you know, uh, there are also several other causes of anal incontinence. And uh, let's start by this uh, study we have done uh, uh, a few years ago, which uh, uh, is very interesting because it shows two points. The first point, is uh, the high frequency of the rate of uh, functional defecation disorder in the French population, about, as you know, 40%, and uh, with at least disorders once a month in 50% of patients, with, of course, a significant impact uh, in terms of quality of life, particularly in case, of course, of incontinence. The second point is that only a few patients consult for these disorders. As you see, no medical visit in more than two thirds of patients and a very few investigation, paraclinic investigation, as you see, less than 4% of cases. As you know, uh, there are surgi several surgical techniques and above all, we must, uh, uh, for, for the, we are going to discuss about anal sphincter repair, including sphincterography and myography. The second group of surgery is uh, neosphincter, including gracilloplasty and artificial anal sphincter. Uh, a main place uh, we are going to discuss is sacral nerve stimulation, but, we must not forget this surgical technique, definitive colostomy, malon procedure, which can greatly improve the quality of life. So let's start now by anal sphincter repair. As you know, uh, anal sphincter repair is a, a surgical treatment of choice for patients with uh, fecal incontinence associated with an external anal sphincter defect caused by, uh, for example, obstetric or anorectal injuries, but with a rupture less than 120 degrees. As you know, this technique consists in an overlapping anterior sphincteroplasty. And in fact, the objective of this technique is to do an overlapping repair of the external voluntary sphincter, uh, an incision is performed at the skin defect, and the ends of the separated external sphincter are located and shuttered. An overlapping is then fashioned, as you see on uh, this schema. 
So what about, uh, what about the results? As you can see, I write poor results. And as you see, uh, short-term results are quite excellent, as you see in this diagram. More than 80% of patients say that they have good results. But unfortunately, the medium and the long-term results at five years, they are very bad uh, because the success rate is only around 40% in these studies. The, the authors tried to identify uh, success predictive factors, as you see, and you can say that no distal neuropathy, integrity of internal sphincter, age less than 50 years, and a rupture less than 160 degrees are success predictive factors. But you have to remember that unfortunately, anal sphincter repair is associated with long, with poor long-term results. Less than a half percent of patients say no continence, not good continence. So uh, sometimes the authors say that you can associate it, uh, a myography. A myography uh, could uh, increase the results of functional disorders. Uh, it's in fact very simple procedure. It's only a plicature of the levator animus cells, anteriorly or posteriorly. But as you see, has the anal sphincter repair results, the two year success rate is quite good, 50%. But unfortunately, the five year success rate is very low, 25% of success. Let's, uh, 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 we can discuss now the second group, the neosphincter and the gracilloplasty. Uh, gracilloplasty uh, was initially described by uh, Picrel in 1952 to treat the children with anal incontinence. Uh, but there was, and the authors uh, say that there was a degradation of the functional results over time. For, for these reasons, uh, other authors showed that low frequency stimulation of striated muscles increased the proportion of the slow fibers and they describe dynamic gracilloplasty. This technique is, uh, is very challenging. This technique is, is uh, also very limited to tertiary centers because it's a very difficult technique. Uh, for, uh, I, I learned this technique with Professor Eric Rullier in University Bordeaux Hospital. And now in uh, my personal experience, I only use this technique for rectovaginal fistula. Uh, we, I, I, I don't prefer, perform any more dynamic gracilloplasty because uh, you are going to see very good results, but very high morbidity. So th the technique, as you see in this, uh, in these photos, is uh, a perineal transposition of the gracilis muscle. Its lens allows to encircle the anal canal and its proximal vascular pedicle allows the full mobilization, as you see in this uh, operative views, the full mobilization of the muscles with conservation of the vascularization around the anus. The, the gracilis, the muscle, is dissected on the leg, then rotated and pass through the perineorectal area. Uh, at the end of the procedure, I, I don't know if we can say, yes, you can see in this uh, schema, uh, two electrodes are inserted into the muscle with an external stimulator uh, placed in subcutaneous, as you see in these photos. So it's why it's a very challenging procedure. But as you see in this, uh, in this study, uh, long-term results are quite good. To more than 
percent of patients say that they have good continence. But as you see, there are a lot of post-therapy morbidity, including mainly perineal sepsis in around 34% of patients. Uh, the main, uh, the, the main uh, effect post-operative is distal constipation, which can, uh, uh, which can be in, uh, as you see, in around 40% of patients. The failure rate is uh, uh, conversion to colostomy is quite high, essentially due to perineal sepsis more than 30% uh, 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 of patients uh, required conversion to colostomy uh, uh, because of perineal sepsis. So to resume, uh, challenging procedure, good results, good results, but very high postoperative morbidity. So now, uh, even Eric Rullier, uh, we didn't perform anymore uh, dynamic gracilloplasty, but we only use gracilloplasty to treat, uh, uh, I think it, it's a very good option to treat uh, only rectovaginal fistula, complex rest rectovaginal fistula. So, uh, uh, as uh, I, I told you, obstructive defecation, co distal constipation, is a significant problem after gracilloplasty. And uh, uh, the individual patient can expect, as I told you, uh, a 16% chance of normal fecal continence at five years, but with at least one surgical morbidity. The second group of neosphincter is artificial anal sphincter. So, uh, as you can see, it's very simple. Uh, since June 210, uh, you cannot use uh, the acticon sphincter uh, because uh, uh, the American uh, say that uh, it was uh, uh, it. it, 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 it it conducted to a, a, a very high morbidity and the explantation rate was very high, more than 30% uh, of cases. In Europe, we didn't have the same feeling than in America. Uh, as you see, the success rate was quite high, 70% of uh, cases, but the, the, the prosthesis remo removal was required in one third of patients. So, uh, unfortunately, due to post-operative sexes, uh, the American government says no more acticon, no more uh, no sphincter, uh, artificial anal sphincter. So, since we we try to use magnetic anal sphincter, but it's only preliminary uh, results, and perhaps. It could be in a few years a good uh, option because, as you see, the success rate is quite high 70, 80% of success rates with less than 20% of explantation due to sepsis. So, perhaps uh, in two or three years, it could be a good option for, uh, for anal incontinence. Let's continue with uh, sacral nerve modulation. As you know, sacral nerve modulation is only the main treatment uh, for anal incontinence. Uh, originally, sacral nerve stimulation was developed for urinary voiding dysfunction. And it has been used for the treatment of uh, patients with fecal incontinence, as you see. Uh, since 1988. Uh, for example, in France, uh, the, the French government approved uh, this technique for the treatment for anal incontinence in 2009. And since 2000, uh, uh, 
11, we can use in France uh, sacral nerve modulation. What is sacral nerve modulation? It's in fact an implanted neurostimulator which stimulates electrically the sacral nerve via the S3 foramen. This uh, technique uses low amplitude electrical stimulation. The second question is how does it work? In fact, uh, three points are very important. The first point is in fact, sacral nerve modulation creates a bridge between brain and pelvis area, improving nerve messages. So it improves the anal resting and squeeze pressures. And this change the rectal sensitivity and the rectal motility. The second point to explain how does it work is that it increase the external anal sphincter activity. And the third effect is the effect on colonic motricity. So the bridge between brain and pelvis and the colonic motricity are the main explications uh, for sacral nerve modulation. And the effect of external sphincter activity is only a, a, a little effect. So it's why we can use sacral nerve modulation for anal incontinence due to injured anal sphincter. Even, oh, if, even the anal sphincter is injured, you can use sacral nerve modulation because the effect on the anal sphincter is very, very low. So what is the technique? As you know, the main uh, advantage of the technique is, you, is that you have a test phase. The first step is in fact a test phase to see if it doesn't work or if it works. So uh, you have to, uh, to uh, uh, perform the technique on general anesthesia. It's simple for the surgeon. And the technique is to insert the electrode through the lower back patient in prone position in the S3 foramen. As you see in this, in this film, you have to the, so the patient is in prone position under general anesthesia. A needle is inserted into the sacral foramen as you can see. So you try to you check the S3 for a man. Oops, you are in. And you are going to test your needle with an external stimulator. And as you can see, motor response are observed and typical response at S3 is the bowel movement of the anus. And the second effect is plantar flexion of the big toe, as you can see. So it means if you have these two motor responses, you are in S3 foramen. It's the best uh, way to stimulate. So here are operative views. So, as I told you, first step is to repair S3 foramen. I am in, I think, but I'm going to check. So, second point. Sorry. Second point, I'm going to test, to check. So, I'm going to check in radiography. I am in S3 foramen. As you can see, the third step is I'm going to stimulate to see if I am a big stimulation. 
So it's an ethanol stimulator. And I touch the electrode, as you can see. And as you can see, you have the two motor response, the bowel movement of the anus and the pelvic floor, it's good. And you are going to see the plantar flexion of the big toe, it's okay. I have a good stimulation, so my electrode is in the good position. So now I put the definitive electrode in S3 for Amen because I am in the, I, I, I've checked the position, so it's good. I'm going to check on the radiography and you are going to see the four electrode on S3. Oops. Here are the four electrodes. So it's okay. And now the patient go back to uh, in home and with an external pacemaker during two or three weeks. And you can consider that the test is positive if the patient said that he has a more than 50% or greater improvement noted by him. So if your patient say, I have in 50% uh, 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 increased uh, by this uh, stimulation, it's, you can consider the test as positive. So the phase two, the stage two, is implantation, only implantation of the pacemaker in subcutaneous. It's, uh, in, uh, it's performed under local anesthesia. Patients are admitted uh, as a day case. And as you see, you just put the definitive pacemaker in subcutaneous area and the electrode is connected uh, to the pacemaker. So as you see, very simple procedure. So as I told you, uh, the main indications are anal incontinence with normal external sphincter, but also with anal sphincter defect or injury the less than 120 degrees. What about the results? As you can see, in this uh, uh, review, the, the definitive implantation rate is very low, is very high, sorry, more than 90% of cases, if you select very well your patients. And if you select very, yell, very well your patients, as you can see, the median uh, term results are quite good, more than 80% of the sex race. Another studies, as you can see, uh, the long-term results are quite good, uh, less than 60% of good results. And uh, in the, the, the group of uh, the European group uh, of coloproctology, we have reviewed more than 200 patients and uh, in uh, intent to treat, you can say that uh, the success rate is very good around 60% of patients. And this rate, 60%, is considered as a good rate. So what is the future for sacral nerve modulation? I think that uh, in my center, we propose uh, this technique for patients with low anterior resection syndrome, because you know that uh, more than 200 of patients can have uh, uh, bad uh, functional results uh, following proctectomy, as uh, Joel uh, uh, will explain uh, in the uh, second conference. So it's quite a good option for these patients operated uh, with uh, LAR syndrome. So in conclusion for uh, uh, sacral nerve modulation, uh, to date, it's the only treatment for fecal incontinence, but be careful, it does not always work. 
you have to select your patients with good response. And if you have a good selection, success rate is about 60, 70% for implanted patients. 50% of patients will have good continence and only 20 to 40% of patients will be not satisfied. It's a non-invasive treatment with the main advantage, the fast test. If it doesn't work, you can remove easily the electrode. I think we have new indications for patients operated with a proctectomy and perhaps in this, uh, it will be the return of anal artificial sphincter. Uh, 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 oh, sorry. The return of anal and artificial sphincter with the magnetic sphincter. But as I told you in my introduction, you have uh, uh, not to forget two techniques the Malone procedure. I don't, I don't know if you know uh, what is Malone procedure. Uh, it was described in 1990 by Malone. It's in fact a, an anti grad washout uh, to have production of stool. You can use the appendix of the distal ileum as a stoma and uh, you wash your colon uh, by this way, by this stoma. Uh, this is an operative view. I never use appendix, I only use uh, the terminal ileum. So I uh, do a plasty with a distal ileum and I put it in stoma. And this is a way to wash the colon. Uh, so I only this. And you have not to forget to the second technique, the definitive colostomy. It's not a failure for the surgeon or for your patients because you have to think in terms of quality of life for your patients. If you had tried sacral nerve modulation, Malone procedure, you have to think about the quality of your patients. You, I, 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 I write, you do not confuse technical challenge as Superman with a quiet and peaceful life. So in conclusion, uh, for incontinent patients uh, in Louis Mourier University Hospital, we have a staff about pelvic perineology, as we have a staff for oncologic problems. You need a multidisciplinary discussion with physician, radiologist, proctologist. Tacral nerve modulation in the, is the main treatment for anal incontinence. Sphincterography leads to very bad results and scar perineum. Gracilloplasty, good results, I, I told you, but very high mobility. So I don't use any more gracilloplasty. Artificial sphincter, perhaps, uh, perhaps with a magnetic sphincter in uh, two or three years. Uh, and uh, uh, don't forget patient's quality of life Malone and colostomy. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor. It's a very nice and uh, elaborated lecture. So would you like Prof. Duell to, to proceed for the next lecture or should we take uh, questions first? Uh, sorry, I didn't hear you, so, sorry. Okay. Uh, would you like to, to, uh, to take questions first or comments, or would you like to proceed for the uh, next lecture? I think that I, I, I have to go <laughs> to, stop, uh, to stop now because I have to go back to Paris, but oh. perhaps Joel could uh, discuss with you at the end of uh, his session Perfect. because he, he knows uh, everything. It's my, uh, <laughs> it's my master, so he, he, oh, he knows okay. everything. everything I know, so uh, I, I trust. I, I only to, to thank you very much for your invitation. Thank, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you much and have a, a safe trip to Paris. Quite an honor for me to, to discuss with you, so. Thank you very much, thank you. So. Perfect. Bye. Thank you, Prof. Duel. Yes. Well, yours now. Thanks, uh, Nadia. Thanks. Uh, I can speak now.
Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. You can speak now. So I will uh, do my lectures. Uh, and um, um, we will have a discussion uh, later. And uh, you have understood that uh, uh, if we can prevent this type of uh, symptom, uh, it's better uh, because uh, sur surgical or medical solutions are not um, the best for the quality of life. So I will share my my screen. So I will choose 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 what this is. I will try to change. Ah. Is it okay for you now? Do you yes, hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. And we yes. can see your screen. Okay. Uh, I don't know where it where is my mouse. Oh. Okay. So the educational objectives of this uh, lecture concerning the fecal incontinence after colorectal and coronal uh, um, uh, surgery um, are the, um, to discuss the basic aspect of uh, the fecal incontinence and the mechanism, to describe uh, the um, possible types of colorectal uh, or coronal anastomotic technique, and uh, to discuss the uh, anastomotic specific functional surgical outcome. Sorry. Fecal incontinence is one of the symptoms of anterior resection syndrome. A low anterior, we say in the majority of cases, occurring after colorectal and coronal uh, resection surgery with or without sanctuary preservation but also after sigmoid resection, called in this uh, type of surgical procedure, sigmoid resection syndrome. What are the symptoms of uh, anterior resection syndrome or sigmoid resection syndrome? It's a mix of high bowel frequency per day with uh, liquid stools multiple evacuation and multiple movements within a limited time of period. This is what we call the fragmentation of the stools. Urgency, patient is obliged to go rapidly to the toilet to avoid uh, uh, fecal uh, incontinence. Uh, that is a um, uh, symptom that uh, the, is a big handicap for the quality of life. Fecal incontinence is involuntary loss of stools or flatus. It is uh, defined according to Angel's criteria. That is a uh, sudden urge incontinence. It's mainly uh, during a rectal contraction with a bad sphincter. <coughs> it can be a passive incontinence sphincter weakness or um, uh, sensibility um, of the sphincter destroy or mixed or can arrive after defecation. Okay. It is. We have a uh, fecal uh, classification um, incontinence classification um, according to the fecal incontinence severity index score or a more used the Jorg and Wexner score that is the Cleveland Clinic Florida fecal incontinence score and uh, we see that uh, perfect continence is a score zero and uh, Complete incontinence is score 20. 
So we evaluate the frequency of uh, the incontinence for solid, liquid, gas, uh, um, adding a wheel pad and um, alteration of lifestyle. And this is evaluated depending of uh, never arrive, uh, rarely less than one month, sometimes uh, one per week or one per month, um, usually one per day, one um, and uh, uh, always, so every day. What we see if we analyze the patient um, uh, with incontinence, the cause are not so often concerning um, surgery and particularly colorectal surgery. We have uh, um, a lot of patients after uh, procto, uh, procto, proctocological uh, surgical procedures, um, fistula, uh, hemorrhoid, uh, uh, and um, we see that it's a lot of patients. But after rectal surgery, in the population of patients operated, uh, 100 patients operated, this is um, a paper of uh, Eric Rullier uh, in 2004, uh, we have uh, not so many patients and we see that a lot of uh, pathology provoke incontinence, but it's not mainly the surgical procedures. Type of surgical procedure, we see that anterior resection, it's 20%. Uh, restorative proctocolectomy, it's 5%. But we have 30% for hemorrhoidal uh, surgical procedures or sphincterotomy. Um, and other procedure as star procedure that is uh, around 10%. So we see that, uh, uh, and we will speak only after the uh, colorectal resection. And uh, what we have to know, we have to know the physiology of the defecation. When we have the defecation, we have the bowel mass uh, in the storage in the sigmoid column. And we have a movement into the sigmoid that will fill and distance the rectum like this in, uh, uh, and stimulate the receptor, parasympathetic. Receptor then will transmit the signal of fullness along afferent fiber to neuron in the spinal cord, this. And uh, after a spinal reflex is initiated with a parasympathetic motor fiber, stimulating the rectum and sigmoid colon and provoking a relaxation of the internal um, anal sphincter. And then for the defecation, we will have a voluntary motor neuron that uh, will inhibit the external anal sphincter to relax and facilitate the exoneration of the feces. But other factors very important, as uh, you know, it is an uh, angulation between the anal canal and the rectum, the low rectum, the angulation um, around 90 degrees provoke uh, um, valve, we call flap valve, uh, with the um, head of uh, um, the puborectalis muscles that is uh, um, um, contracted during the rest. But after uh, stimulation or when we have uh, the uh, inside the um, um, feces arriving in the rectum, patient sit on the toilet will provoke a relaxation of the pelvic floor and the external anal sphincter, all somatic by this way. And the angle will straighten and uh, we will have a 
um, uh, straight on, um, um, uh, direction that will facilitate the uh, exoneration, particularly with the pressure due to the uh, abdominal pressure due to the valsalva um, uh, technique um, uh, and uh, rectal pressure will increase facilitating, facilitating the exoneration and evacuation of the tubes. We have to understand other mechanisms. The, particularly the quality of the anal canal. We have two parts, the superior part and low half part, that is skin. Superior half part, we have captor, um, receptor, that will um, evaluate the passage of uh, gas, of um, uh, stools, of liquid, and will uh, provoke contraction of the sphincter. So, what are the causes of fecal incontinence? The loss of rectal reservoir is one of the causes. The loss of anorectal angle, if you do a too straight um, uh, without uh, uh, tension-free anastomosis, you will have a higher risk of uh, um, fecal incontinence. Um, anorectal uh, sensitivity reduction of the captor inside the anal canal. The anal sphincter injuries, but also, we will see later, autonomic nerves injury and colonic dysmobility. All that, uh, those factors can, uh, all those causes can provoke fecal incontinence with a big impact on quality of life. So we can say after surgery, we can have fecal incontinence due to rectal reservoir loss or dysfunction, functional um, uh, reservoir loss. In case of anal sphincter damage and in case of colonic dysmotility. First, we will see rectal reservoir loss and dysfunction and the solution. We know that capacity and compliance are reduced in neurorectum. It is why when we do a colo rectal or low colorectal or coloanal anastomosis, we recommend to do the anastomosis, not on the sigmoid, particularly in um, West countries where we have um, uh, non-compliant sigmoid with a lot of um, uh, diverticulosis, uh, diverticulum and uh, with um, uh, non-compliant um, uh, bowel. This means that we will have greater pressure, maybe illicit in the neurectum than in the normal rectum using the same volume. So it is uh, one of the problems. This situation supports the idea that some patient who should undergo low anterior resection with coronal elastomosis might benefit from the construction of a more capacious neorectal reservoir using a colonic pouch. This was the solution proposed. We will see how later. But we have to know that ill anastomotic leaks, so complication, post-operative complication, radiotherapy, particularly post-operative radiotherapy, and uh, post neoadjuvant and adjuvant, are predictive negative factor for neorectal function. Loss of rectal uh, reservoir. There is a lot of randomized study. What they conclude? It's good to have a small reservoir um, for distal uh, anastomosis. We will see which level um, or coloanal anastomosis 
we have better results during six months, one year, but at two years, we have no difference with a good coloanal and particularly side to hand anastomosis. So coloanal versus local rectal uh, with uh, or without uh, reservoir, we can say that the reservoir is good, but temporarily comparing to uh, um, straight anastomosis and the colonic uh, G pouch is a small pouch, four to six centimeters maximum, because above we will have other complications as push it and constipation. Loss of anorectal angle. You see, this is a normal angle, 90. This is after surgery. And we know that after relaxation of the pubo rectalis, we will have the angulation around 120 degrees that will facilitate the descent of the, the pelvis because relaxation of the pubo rectalis and evacuation by the pressure. This is a patient after um, coloanal anastomosis, uh, manual coloanal straight anastomosis. And we see that we have um, angulation on rest that is a good angulation with a flap valve that will uh, control better uh, evacuation. And this is a similar uh, um, uh, um, uh, physiological angulation. Anal factor damage. You see, we can have internal sphincter damage, failure. We can have external sphincter failure. We can have anorectal angulation uh, not uh, respected. We can have anal cushion in the um, uh, destroy in the upper half of anal canal, what we call the transitional zone. And we can have a bad or excess abdominal pressure on the upper rectum, anterior uh, and lower part of uh, the uh, rectum. Anal sphincter damage, external anal sphincter. This is a part of voluntary external sphincter. So it is a voluntary control uh, and relax with high pressure above. We can have lesion of the dip, superficial and subcutaneous external sphincter. The internal sphincter is an extension of the circular muscles that become the involuntary internal anal sphincter, which relax with moderate pressure from above. So this is relaxation when we have um, um, stools inside. And uh, longitudinal muscles become fibrous inside the anal canal. And in the anal canal, we have this. The cushion captor receptor. This is what we will remove, we will see later, when uh, we do the sleeve mucosectomy, like this. As uh, I said, anal cushion in the upper half of the anal canal, general opposition and mucosal fold, transitional zone. Uh, it is a work I did 30 years ago, evaluating the functional assessment of coronal anastomosis with reservoir and excision of the anal transition zone. Before people were saying, oh, it, when we do that, all the patients are incontinent. What we have seen when we do the excision of the 
anal transitional zone, we have no risk of inconvenience due to this removal. Only the poor fractional results were mainly due to uh, the um, size of the reservoir and uh, um, um, hyper tonicity of the colonic reservoir, but not the transitional zone. So don't be afraid if you have to do a sleeve mucosectomy. Internal sphincter injuries. What is not very known, but what we have to take care, it is when we do stapler anastomosis. When we introduce stapler in through, through the um, anal canal, we provoke injury with a stapler. And we know that some people say we have to use uh, more and more big stapler. And uh, some randomized study did evaluation and, uh, of the injury. And uh, uh, this tactic of introduction may result in anal sphincter defect and impair anal pressure when assessed at six months of follow-up. So even if it is a transitory um, uh, phenomenon, we have to take care when we have to introduce a stapler, we have to do slowly and gently. Other possibility we were using in open technique is a Baker technique. Doing anastomosis as we do for the bypass now, um, doing a, a side to hand anastomosis, introducing the anvil by uh, uh, open procedure, but it is not used uh, actually by laparoscopy. But it is better and we have, we do analysis by uh, ultrasonography and uh, we uh, have uh, verified that there was no um, um, uh, injury when we use this technique. So Tepler can be dangerous for the sphincter. Internal sphincter injuries or internal sphincter resection. Sometimes we have to uh, preserve the sphincter, but for that we have to do oncologic surgical procedure. And we have to resect uh, more, uh, particularly laterally. And depending on the position of the tumor, we have to resect. Uh, the um, um, distal segment respecting oncologic principles and laterally too. So depending on the position, and uh, as you see, we have a different type of resection we, and different type of anastomosis we will do. We can do partial intersphincteric, subtotal intersphincteric resection or total intersphincteric resection. We do uh, inter uh, for all the procedure, coloanal anastomosis on you only. Above, we can do mechanical anastomosis, but uh, doing a sleeve mucosectomy, we have seen before, we remove only the mucosa, we don't remove the muscles. Other type, this is a classification of uh, Rullier type two. We do partial intersphincteric resection like this. And type three, we do a total intersphincteric resection, keeping only the external sphincter. Colonic dysmotility. Colonic dysmotility. Automatic nerve preservation, sigmoid syndrome. Only to remember that recently was described 
as the low anterior resection syndrome, the sigmoid resection syndrome. Um, and uh, I um, uh, have um, some uh, um, paper concerning my functional results and uh, one of my uh, fellow, uh, Antonello Forgione, uh, did a beautiful paper published in Annals of Surgery, as you see, evaluating the functional outcome after laparoscopic uh, sigmoidectomy uh, for uh, sigmoiditis, for benign disease. And uh, there was a, a significant improvement in quality of life in social function uh, after uh, surgery. And this paper was uh, in reference for Professor Wexner, uh, saying it's the first time that uh, we do a demonstration that surgery is a benefit for the patient for in sigmoiditis. And we were very happy. Uh, we don't say that we were surprised, but there was a problem. The problem is our technique is particular because we don't do a sigmoidectomy in benign disease for um, um, sigmoiditis using the same technique than in cancer. We preserve superior rectal vessels, IME and IMV. And we preserve also all the nerve and do a resection um, uh, for benign disease. So this is our operative technique that it is a uh, technique uh, used in open. And later, because we published in 2009, but in 2011, if I remember, uh, 12, uh, Italian team um, did a, a study and explaining that preserving the vessels give better results. I will uh, explain probably why it is uh, so important and how we can evaluate this. It is uh, uh, because uh, when we preserve the vessels, we preserve to the um, autonomic nerves for the rectum. And we have seen that there is a control of uh, the um, contractility of the rectum and the captor coming along the nerve. And uh, we can evaluate these results doing a manometry to evaluate the colonic motility and reveal the contractile segmental activity and propagand contraction of much greater amplitude that uh, can provoke this type of uh, um, problem uh, with uh, incontinence. What are the type of anastomosis we can do in colorectal surgery? We can do mechanical, manual, hybrid, um, do immediate or delayed anastomosis, straight, end to hand, simple side to hand, debouch, coloplasty. Straight, you see Parks technique, simple side to hand, Baker, you remember, by uh, using a stapler, side to hand with a jet pouch, or coloplasty. This is a standard technique of a night griffin. When we do sigmoidectomy, we will do anastomosis uh, after we have introduced the anvil in the proximal colon. And we do side to hand using night griffin technique. You know this technique very well. And this is a standard we do in uh, sigmoidectomy. We can do two side to hand anastomosis. You see, through a suprapubic incision, we introduce the anvil and um, exteriorize it on antimesenteric side. And we divide at this level. Uh, and uh, after, and it is recommended, you see, when we have uh, rectal stump, 
five, four centimeter residual to increase the volume of this um, uh, stump. And uh, we will do the anastomosis using a stapler. I transfix, as you see, um, on the side uh, of the, to remove the corner to avoid uh, two ears anastomosis. And we will do side to hand like this, anastomosis. So you remember, I recommend to do not only myself, but uh, it is how we do. It is similar than end uh, uh, to hand anastomosis. And even for sigmoidectomy, John Nichols from uh, St. Mark's Hospital were recommending this type of anastomosis first to have uh, better functional results, better vascularization, and uh, uh, easy uh, anastomosis. So this is uh, what we do. We will control at the end. This is uh, a control of this type of anastomosis, you see, side to hand, like this, with a 3D uh, control, uh, CT scan, and uh, the possibility to analyze the control. It is done before closing the diverting stoma. Other possibility, doing coloanal side to hand anastomosis, unmade, and we do this for coloanal. You remember I said uh, we have uh, uh, anastomosis after uh, partial, complete, internal resection of the sphincter. And a resection of the internal sphincter. This is a straight anastomosis, coloanal, always same after um, uh, resection um, of the sphincter. You see, you have, it's necessary to have a compliant um, uh, bowel. It's why it is recommended to do on the, the descending curve. With a reservoir, J pouch, this is the case. If it is enough high, we can do anastomosis with a stapler. If not, we do unmade. Only to remember, but more and more use in complex cases, the delayed coloanal anastomosis. It is recommended in uh, morbidly obese patient in case of um, to cure after fistula, uh, in case of reoperation after irradiation. Uh, the advantage of, it can be the um, uh, possibility to do anastomosis without diverting stoma, avoiding also a permanent colostomy. Uh, with a low risk of leak, you see, we dissect, we pull, we fix temporarily like this, sorry, uh, with a part of the colon outside. Uh, a few days later, we uh, resect after we verify that there is no necrosis and we do the anastomosis. So this is a possibility, particularly in complex cases. What are the functional results of this type of anastomosis? So we have a lot of paper. We can say that um, TME after um, uh, with side to hand J pouch or end to hand anastomosis, uh, we have a risk of uh, low anterior resection at three months, around 70%, reduce at 12 months. 
With a partial, it's very low. That is a low colorectal anastomosis. So lower risk at major low anterior section after partial compared to TME. But these are not the same indication. It is why it's difficult to compare. We don't do same procedure. Comparison between the different techniques, there is no significant difference in surgical outcome between any of the reconstructive techniques. But actually, transverse coloplasty, I've not spoke of that, uh, comparing to J pouch, is not really used due to the high morbidity of this technique. In conclusion, we can say that there is a superiority of colonic J pouch over straight colon anastomosis, which disappear in the late postoperative period. That means uh, one year, two years. Functional outcome of uh, side to hand colon anastomosis are comparable to those of colonic J pouch in the late postoperative period with lower morbidity. So I recommend to do this type of anastomosis. Oh, sorry. So after mucosal excision, it is what I did. Um, and uh, you see the quality of the results is very important because we have had no um, um, incontinence on 12 patients having this type of procedure. After um, intersanctary resection, Results are not really perfect. As you see, we have full incontinence around 50%. But honestly, I have uh, not the feeling, and we are doing the analysis of the last results because we try to respect all the factors I have uh, described to reduce this uh, uh, risk of incontinence and to improve the quality, we will see what to do. Improving fecal incontinence. We have different tools. We have medical treatment, rehabilitation, and we have seen um, surgery at the end. Many treatments are available, but there is not enough evidence to support the effectiveness of any of them. First of all, conservative measure aim at symptomatic control, dietary regimen, pharmacotherapy, including motricity control, constipating agent, and enema, maybe try. Colonic irrigation in the morning in order to clean the colon of feces has been shown to reduce symptoms and quali improve quality of life. How I do? When I do this type of surgery, during the time the patient will have a diverting stoma, I, day two, I begin a post-operative test and rehabilitation. This is as a Malone technique. Patient is on the toilet. We put on the distal segment of the diverting stoma, um, uh, urinary catheter, and uh, we do irrigation with uh, saline serum. And we do anterograde colonic enema on a bowel well prepared before. And the fluid saline serum pass through the colon. And on the toilet, the patient will uh, have the feeling of evacuation of, of the fluid. And uh, I ask him to control closing with a voluntary contraction the anus and to open and to control. If he is able to do that, it's a good test. And uh, uh, if he is controlling perfectly, we think that re-education is not necessary. If not, we will do the test regularly till we will have good results and uh, before closing the, um, um, the diverting stoma, usually we close at one month. Uh, normal frequency um, varies um, 
from three times a day to three times a week. You see, we have to uh, have a good consistency of the stools. If we have entirely liquid stools, it will be difficult to control. Rehabilitation is uh, another solution. Um, uh, after, um, in case of fecal incontinence, after sphincter saving surgery, uh, give encouraging results. There is always a benefit for the patient. And uh, the biofeedback uh, also is interesting. Biofeedback therapy produces significant clinical benefit for the patient. So we have to use before thinking surgery. Surgery, we have seen, we have uh, less of minimal invasive procedure uh, concerning uh, uh, the surgical procedure described by... Um, uh, sorry, described by Frédéric Bretagnol. And invasive, we have seen with uh, electrostimulation. In conclusion, Fecal incontinence after colorectal surgery may be dependent of multiple factors as fecal frequency, stool consistency and volume, uh, liquid stools or solids, dysfunction of the anal sphincter allows the escape of liquid stools, the bowel function is presumably improved by solidifi solidifying the liquid stool of postoperative patients. The loss of rectal ref inhibitor reflex, we have seen um, when we remove the um, transitional zone, we have no rectal inhib inhibitory reflex, but we have a good continence. So it's not really true. Loss of the rectal reservoir function, um, because we cannot retain liquid stools, if we have uh, uh, no reservoir, and the lesion of the sphincter caused by instrumental dilatation, stapler, or um, uh, in case of on the anastomosis, if we do uh, dilatation, traumatic dilatation, the disturbed function of the internal sphincter due to autonomous nerve damage additionally contribute to the anal dysfunction. It is why we have to take care when we do this surgery, preserving autonomic nerves. Fecal incontinence problem after colorectal surgery can have a major impact on quality of life. Surgical nerve damage may play a major role in the development of fecal incontinence. It's not only for urogenital um, problem, uh, it's also for digestive um, problem, particularly for continence. Fecal incontinence can worsen over time in case of uh, adjuvant therapy, and particularly after surgery. Respecting or rebuild the different factor of continence evoked in this lecture is the best way to prevent minor or major problem of fecal continence. Several non-surgical therapy of for fetal incontinence problem are available, but conservative therapy should be the first line choice. This is what I wanted to tell you and to share with you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you all very much, Professor Joel Lore, for this very nice and elaborative uh, session. Uh, now the floor is open for uh, any question or comment or query. Anyone have any question, please unmute yourself or raise your hand or write it down in the chat. Sorry, I wish to... Is it okay? Yeah. 
It's okay? Yes, yes. So I think we have no question. You did uh, all of the, you cover all of the aspect of uh, how to prevent this very challenging problem, fecal incontinence. And Professor Friedrich, I think he covered uh, the most available option of how we can deal with this very challenging problem. And uh, if we have no more question. No, I uh, wish to show the, what the surgeon is uh, thinking, is not always thinking, but when he's doing a surgical, advanced surgical procedure in colorectal uh, uh, cancer, is um, taking care of uh, anatomy, um, uh, removing uh, um, uh, the tumor, the segment with the tumor, doing oncologic procedure, but respecting maximum anatomy and uh, um, uh, physiology. So he is always thinking to all of this. If not, he's doing APR every time. But more we do preservation, oncologic preservation, and more um, uh, we have to take care to have good functional results. And it's, uh, it seemed to me important to remember all the factors we know concerning. And we have seen that uh, Frederic is uh, using electrostimulation, he's speaking nerve. So if, if we can preserve as a um, uh, uh, nerves, um, it will be better and easier for him also for um, um, uh, stimulating the, um, uh, the different uh, uh, nerve um, to have a better continence. Sorry, went out of I've experienced some problem with that MacBook. That's fine. So thank you very much for the lecture. So I do have a couple of questions. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so the first question is: Do you use the polar score? So, as like presumptively, presumptively, will know that the uh, the outcome of your surgery, if the patient is going to develop Lars syndrome or not. Do you use what? The polar score. The? The polar, the polar, the P O I, the P O A L A R, ah, yeah, the yeah. polar score, yes. Yes, when we, uh, when we do analysis and study, yes, we do. Um, you have seen that uh, I published different uh, paper concerning uh, um, quality of life. We, we do analysis complete analysis okay. concerning sexual, concerning urinary, concerning uh, um, um, digestive, uh, because uh, sometimes when we have to operate patient, particularly in the sigmoidectomy for sigmoiditis, we are not speaking of cancer, well, it's necessary. Yes. Uh, we have to operate the patient to have better quality of life. So this is a main factor. It's not, uh, to avoid uh, uh, a cancer, uh, evolution of a cancer, it's to have a better quality of life after surgery. And uh, it is, uh, you, you can read the paper, I can send to you if you wish, but we, we, we tried to verify, it, and it is more and more what we do in uh, West countries, in, uh, uh, in um, uh, countries where um, patient with internet wish to have better functional result, quality of life. Yeah, perfect. They don't so want to have scar. They don't want to have yeah. scar. They want to have, we, we are good and we do miracle. Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, so the second question is, so since like the Dutch are not using, are not using, uh, or are not uh, using aliostomy anymore when they are doing low anterior um, resection, mm -hmm. because it contributes to the, to the Lars, to the Lars syndrome. So what is your intake about that? 
I, I'm not sure that it's uh, ileostomy that uh, contribute to the uh, low anterior syndrome, uh, but um, it depends of the patient. You see, I'm in Asia, and what we do, um, if we do radiochemotherapy before, I will recommend to do um, systematically a protective stoma. We keep it one month, so it's not a long time. We are speaking of cancer. Uh, we are yes. speaking of cancer. And um, I cannot um, say don't do. Even if when I operate, I don't do systematically. But it is uh, mainly depending on the type of patient. If you have an obese patient, if you have a, a fragile patient, um, if uh, you have a difficult surgical procedure, if you have advanced um, tumor, if you have, it's not the same that having a limited tumor, slim patient, as we have in Asia. You are slim too, you would seem uh, when I see yes. you. Uh, so, but you have seen there is some solution now that we can do a delayed surgical procedure with a, we pass through the anal canal. We don't do diverting stoma. Uh, if we have to do uh, one week later, we do. Uh, but um, uh, more and more people are using this type of procedure because functional results are not so bad in the literature. Okay. I don't know if there's any more questions from the participants. Okay, so thank you, Professor, for your nice thank you presentation. Thank you for your invitation. Thanks, thank you very much, uh, thank you. Thanks. So it's nice. Uh, See you again. And um, I work um, a lot to explain my idea and uh, to propose to you with my friend, uh, Frédéric. Frédéric is obliged to go back rapidly in Paris because there is uh, the problem of COVID and um, a third yes. uh, wave arriving and his hospital uh, oh. surgical department uh, will be closed in uh, two days. So uh, the director of the hospital called him to come back mm. to operate rapidly the patients that were scheduled. And uh, okay. he will do operations uh, normally. He, he was scheduled to come back uh, tomorrow, but he is obliged to operate tomorrow morning rapidly and to operate a lot of patients in advance. So this is uh, okay. critical okay. time. Thank you very much, Professor. No problem. Thanks. Yeah, stay safe, please. Thanks. Bye. Bye.